Well, welcome. Um, it's an honor to be preaching here this morning. I was saying before, it's, uh, I just love how Karen themed the platform is this morning. You had Karen, Karen's son, and a dude who's dressed like Karen. So we didn't coordinate that. It wasn't deliberate, but yes, we are dressed the same. I like to think it's because she's dressed like a 25-year-old and not the other way around, um, but that's all right. Um, because she's cool. That's what I'm saying. Anyway, um, no, we love Karen. We love the Castledines. They're a big blessing to this, fa- uh, the, this family, the KH family. Uh, this morning, we are going to be preaching through Deuteronomy. So not all of it, because um, that would take a little while. Um, but some of it, at least, hopefully. Um, and if, you, if you're not familiar, haven't been with us for long, we are, uh, this year our theme is Steps of Testimony. Uh, talking about the Israelites who stepped into the Jordan by faith. And as they stepped in, God parted it and they walked through to the promised land. A few details in between there, but that's sort of the, um, the general vibe of it, if you will. Um, but we're going to be preaching through Deuteronomy, which happens just before um, that, that happens, right? So essentially, Deuteronomy is the fifth book in the Bible, the fifth book of the Torah. We might call it the Pentateuch. It is the first five books of the Bible. And the fifth one is Deuteronomy. And it's essentially one big speech from Moses who is, is pleading with the Israelites. So, so they've just wandered the wilderness for 40 years because they worshipped a golden calf. Silly, right? I wouldn't do it, but they did. And uh, I don't know, ask them. And uh, so they had to wander the wilderness for 40 years. So all the people who actually God brought out of slavery from the captivity of the Egyptians didn't actually go into the promised land because they were disobedient along the way. So Moses is, is talking to the Israelites. They've just come out of this 40 years. So everyone who originally came out of Egypt now has passed away. And he's talking to their kids and their grandkids. So the Israelites that are actually going to go and see the promised land. And he's basically saying, Don't make the same mistakes your parents did. Keep the commandments that God has given you. And he's pleading with them to to be faithful to God's word. But he also reiterates that that God is faithful no matter what. And even through the the mistakes that the Israelites make, God is still going to deliver them into the promised land. Yes, there's consequences and things happened along the way. But he's reiterating to them that, that God is still faithful but he's pleading with them to follow the the commandments. And so he reiterates these commandments to them. So Deuteronomy comes from the the word Deuteronomian, which literally means second law. So if you read through Deuteronomy, you'll probably recognize a lot of the laws. The um, Ten Commandments are in there. He's reiterating that to them. He's going through all these laws that have been given to him. So it's sort of like a nice little recap or summary, if you will. So if you've read the first five books of the Bible, especially through Leviticus and Numbers, it feels like, for some, for some of us, like me, not you holy people, it gets a little dry and you just need to push through for a little bit because it's like a bunch of laws. There's like hundreds of them. Um, Jordan told me the other day, 600 and something. 13, 613. There you go. That's a man of God right there. Whew. And uh, so you've got 613 laws, right? And so that's, that's a lot. So that's, but it's things like super specific that probably will never apply to me. Like what happens if your ox runs through your neighbor's fence? Has that ever happened to anyone? No, great. Well, there you go. So that one doesn't personally apply to us, um, but he's sort of summarizing what these laws are. And, and then he gets, so he's sort of, the first three chapters, he's sort of summarizing what's happened so far in the story. And then he goes into, all right, now what are the commandments of God? And, and right in the middle of that, in chapter six, which is where we're going to look at specifically today, is, is a verse that has become known as the Shema, which is a, a prayer. You, you'd probably know it when we read it. You might recognize it. And it's essentially that the summary says this is the most important commandment of all of them. And you might have heard it before, but we're going to read it with some context today and, and try and apply some understanding and some application as to what that means for us in 2024. All right. Are you ready? So if you're with me, are you still there? Let's go. We love to hear it. All right. So this is the Shema. This is, this is uh, the verse. It's Deuteronomy 6, verse 4 and 5. Hear, O Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. So this became a very famous prayer within Judaism. And Jesus actually reiterated it to us, which means for us it's just as important. So you might recognize that and be like, that's not from Deuteronomy. That's from the gospel. Jesus said that. And you'd be right. On the second part. It is also in Deuteronomy though. So Mark, 
uh, Jesus reiterates it in Mark. So in Mark 12, it's, it's actually in a couple of the Gospels, but we'll read from Mark. So from Mark chapter 12, uh, from verse 28, then one of the scribes came and having heard them reasoning together, perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, which of the first commandment, which is the first commandment of all? Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is. So that's kind of big, like this is the most important commandment. Out of all of them, is it? We never know. Imagine if he was like the most important commandment is if your ox runs through your neighbor's fence. Now, see, that would just, that's right, it's this one. Luckily, it's not the other one. The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Sounding a bit familiar? Hopefully, if you were paying attention a few minutes ago. <laughs> and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And then he says, and the second like it is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. It doesn't mean there aren't other commandments. It doesn't mean there aren't other things that we need to abide by. But he's saying the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And then he says, the second is to love your neighbor as yourself. And we're gonna be focusing on the first part of that today, just the first commandment. Commandment. So what does it actually mean to love God with all your heart, soul, and strength? Like, it's, it sounds really nice. Like, it's really poetic. I feel like you could, like, get a little tattoo of it or, like, put it on the, like, a little sticker on the back of your car or, like, maybe you've read it on the back of a toilet door somewhere or on a tea towel. Who knows? The fact is, it's a, it's a, it's a lovely thing to say. But what does it actually mean? And the fact that he's saying this is a commandment, not like a, this is just a lovely thing. He's saying, you have to do this. So maybe we should be like, oh, okay, great. So what are we doing? What do we actually do? What, 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 what is the practicalities of actually loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind? So the Shema, which is what this is called, is actually the first word of the verse. So hear or listen. And, and it's not just listening, but it's a listening and a responding. And that's the key for uh, Shema. It's a listening and it's a responding. See, it's very easy to listen. There's lots of things around that you could listen to. You could hear a whole lot of things. But there's a big difference between what you can hear and what you actually respond to. You can be listening, but you can, doesn't mean that you're necessarily responding. James says in chapter one, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. See, hearing is not enough. It's one thing to hear, but there needs to be a response. Just ask anyone who's married. You can hear all you want, but there needs to be some sort of response. See, if Ellen, my wife, asked me to pick my clothes up off the floor, I can listen to her till the cows come home. But it doesn't matter if I just leave them there. She might come back to me three days later and say, Jack, did you not hear me? I say, I did hear you. And I listened. I heard every word you said. She's like, but you didn't do it. I'm like, well, I didn't realize that was the important bit. I just thought I had to listen to you. You can listen, but unless there's actually a response, what's the point of listening? We listen to a lot of things in this day and age. There is so much to listen to. We can't escape all the things that we listen to. You open your phone up in the, in the morning and the first thing is just all these things that you could listen to. But the difference is you get to choose what you respond to. You can listen to a whole lot of things. You can hear a lot of things that are happening. But what are you gonna respond to? The Shema, listening and responding. So Moses is pleading with the Israelites. Don't just listen, respond. Let it actually invoke some sort of change within you. See, when God led the Israelites out of Egypt, He, he, he guided them through the wilderness with a, a pillar of cloud during the day and a pillar of fire at night, which is a pretty cool way to be led. I personally have never experienced that, but I reckon that would be pretty cool. But it wouldn't be enough if the Israelites just saw and noticed that that was how God was leading them. Like imagine if you're like, hey, look, God's leading us through that pillar of, of that cloud and the fire. And then they just sat there and it just sort of went off into the distance and that was that. 
Like it's not enough to notice that God's leading you. You have to actually sometimes get up out of your chair and follow where God is leading you. There needs to be some sort of a response. It's not enough just to see that God is leading you or be aware of how God is leading you. You have to actually be called by Him and follow that calling. It means actually sometimes following that pillar, that pillar of fire, following the pillar of of, of cloud that that God is leading you with and actually moving towards it. Because like we are so blessed that we have a God who leads us, right? Who guides us, who calls us, who shows us the way. But imagine if we just let that go off into the distance. What a waste. And it would break my heart to see people just see that God is calling them and they listen, but they don't respond. So let's not just be hearers of the word. Let's be doers of the word. And this is what Moses is pleading with the Israelites to do. But what are you listening to? Because like I said, there's a lot of stuff in this day and age that you can listen to. It's, there's no shortage of things to listen to. So he says, Hear, O Israel, Shema, listen and respond, O Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. In the footnotes of your Bible, or depending on what version you have, it might actually say this, it's saying the Lord alone. In other words, the Lord is one, the Lord alone. So what are we listening to? God, God alone. See, we can listen to God, but we can sort of try and balance it with some of the other things we want to listen and respond to. Like we can respond to God, but we're sort of half responding to God and we're half responding to this and that thing and all these other things that are happening. But Moses is saying to the Israelites, no, the Lord alone, the Lord is one. So when you listen and respond, what are you listening and responding to? Because like I said, you can listen to a lot of things, but the response is what makes the difference. So what are you responding to? Out of all the things that fight for your attention in this day and age, Are you gonna choose to respond to what Jesus says? Choose to respond to His Word, to His calling, to how He's leading and guiding you? Or are you just gonna let yourself be distracted by all the other things that are vying for your attention? Jesus says in Matthew 6, no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to one and despise the other. See, as Moses is saying this to the Israelites, he's very aware that they're about to go into Canaan, which is the promised land. And in Canaan, they have all sorts of false gods like Baal and and all these sort of false made up gods. So he's very aware that even though God's gonna deliver them into the promised land, he's aware there's gonna be a temptation to fall into idolatry and following the other gods that are in Canaan. And he's saying, just remember, you can't serve two masters. The Lord alone is one. And you have to remember as well that the very reason that Moses is talking to these people that their parents weren't seeing the promised land is because of the golden calf, because they decided to idolize another God. And it's easy to mock the Israelites. I laugh at them all the time. I often think they must have been just a bunch of the most silliest little sausages that I've ever heard of. (laughs) I'm like, come on, are you serious? Like God... Moses is up the mountain for a few days, getting an inscribed word of God on a piece of rock. And you can't just hang around. You have to like pull your gold together and make a golden calf and start worshiping that. How thick are you? But I reckon if God wrote a book about us and gave it to the Israelites, they'd be just as embarrassed on our behalf. I think, idiots, you guys are being controlled by like a little device that fits in your pocket. Morons. At least ours was a cool, big, golden calf. (laughs) See, it's so easy to look back and be like, I personally am never going to be tempted to idolize Baal. Some of you might, but I'm not. Just, it's never personally been a a, a personal temptation. But there's other things I'm going to idolize. So what are you idolizing? What are you putting in place of the Lord alone? And you know, this might be the part of the sermon where I start listing a few things and like going through like, it could be this or that or all these different things, but I'm not even gonna taint that because the Holy Spirit might be speaking to you about what that might be, what, the, what, what you're idolizing in your heart that you're not even aware of. So I'm just gonna let the Holy Spirit do that 
And you can decide, because I don't want to sort of paint a picture of, oh, it has to be this or it has to be that. It could be literally different for every single person in this room, and it likely is. So that's between you and God, and I'm going to leave that there. But whatever it is that, that the Holy Spirit is speaking to you about, to not idolize. Remember, the Lord is one, the Lord alone. So we listen and we respond to the Lord alone. He is who guides us. Colossians 3 verse 5 says, Therefore put to death your members who are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. See, these are sins, right? Fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, covetousness. So he's talking, these are sins, right? So you could be idolizing a sin that you have and, and putting that sin, allowing that to, to take the place that God should have in your life. But you also might have some idols that aren't a sin. Like you might just have some things that are actually a great thing. But it becomes a sin when you put it in front of where God should be. Or you prioritize that in front of where God should be prioritized. So what are your idols? That's a question that you can ask yourself. And if you don't know, I encourage you, ask the Holy Spirit. He'll fill you in. He'll let you know. But just remain open to what the Holy Spirit says to you. Because He might reveal something that you didn't even realize you were idolizing. Didn't even, and it might have been something that you thought was a really, really good thing, and it might be. But if you idolize it, that's where the separation comes. So Moses is pleading with him to listen and respond to God and to God alone and not to take other idols. And then he says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And when he says love, he uses the word ahava. Now, some of you might know the, the Greek version of ahava, which is agape, agape love. If you've been around Christianity for a little while, it's a bit of a, a cool word to throw around. And it essentially means unconditional love. So it's an unconditional love. But ahava, which is the Hebrew word that, that Moses uses, is uh, understanding it's an emotion. So you might have that emotion side of love. But on top of that is there's a decision. It's a wholehearted devotion. Because who knows, sometimes... Love doesn't always have the emotion there, but it's still a decision. Like you might not always have the woman fuzzies towards God, and that's all right. And in fact, if that's you, that's okay. I want to encourage you. It's all right. Because you might be feeling like, man, I rock up at church and like I can see all these, some people are like crying in worship because they love God so much. And I, I don't know. I just don't know if I feel anything. Well, it's not just about what you feel. It's about the decision that comes with that. Because love, a harbor love, requires a decision. It requires action. It's not just an emotion. Just ask anyone who has kids. I personally don't have kids, unless golden retrievers count, but I'm pretty sure they don't. All I know is, I've, I've been a kid, so I get it. My poor parents, I apologize profuse, profusely to them. Um, but that's all right, because I'm grown up and I'm all good now, hopefully. Don't ask my wife. But sometimes they might not have felt super lovely towards me. They might not have been like, oh, he's such a great kid. Because sometimes I really wasn't. I know it's hard to believe, but sometimes I was really annoying. Some of you are like, was? No, nah, it's all right. Um, see, but it's not just the emotion. It's not just, you might not have the warm and fuzzies. It's not just about that really nice sort of emotive feeling. And that's great, by the way. Like, if, if you're the person crying in worship, I love that. I love that for you. You go, you get it. But it's a decision that, that's not enough. There's a decision that comes from that. Our love can't just be when we're in worship, like receiving amazing worship and being so engrossed in the presence of God. And that's awesome. I love that. But that's not all that love is. Love then requires a decision on top of that. It requires some action. Jesus says in John 14, if you love me, keep my commandments. Whew. If you love me, keep my commandments. And he says this as he's just about to be taken away to be betrayed and then crucified. So he knows what's about to happen to him. And he says, before he goes, if you love me, keep my commandments. It's not just, if you love me, then have nice feelings towards me. And that's great. Have nice feelings towards Jesus, but actually make a decision to follow him. Actually make a decision to get up each day and actually follow the call that God has for your life. To listen to his commandments, to follow his commandments. And a harbor love is an emotion, but it also has the decision. So then how do we love God? He says to love God 
Moses is saying, love God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. For the word heart, he uses the word labor, which essentially translates to inner man or inner self. So it's like your inner being. So who you are, like other people might not see that, it's who you are inherently. You gotta love God with who you are inherently. Some of you might be thinking, well, I can't change who I am inherently. If I don't inherently love God, does that mean that I'm just not meant to love Him because I don't inherently love Him? I can't change how I think or how I feel inherently. And you may be right at first, but we can change how we feel. See, the things that we think on are the things that we end up becoming. Our inner self is derived purely of all the things that we think of and that we mull on and that we meditate on and that we go over and over in our head. In the psychology world, it's called causal force. It literally means what you believe about yourself becomes true. See, what you think on, what you, what you mull over, what you meditate on is what you become. And it works both ways. Because you might not even realize you've been meditating on things that aren't of God. You've been mulling over and thinking on all these things that, that, that aren't of God. And I'm not saying you're not going to have thoughts of other things. Of course you are. But it's what you, you, you spend your time thinking about, mulling over, meditating, pouring your time and attention into. Is all those things that you're pouring your time and attention into, meditating on and mulling over the things of God? Or are you allowing something else in your life to take that place? There's something else in your life that isn't what God has for you, your inner self, who you are inherently. Proverbs 23 verse seven says, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he. The things that you think about in your heart, that's what you become. And it's easy to not even realize that you're thinking about things that, that you aren't. Or maybe you've been believing lies that, that aren't actually true about you. Someone else has said it, or maybe you've told yourself. Jeremiah says, before I even formed you in the womb, I knew you. God knows you better than you know yourself. Maybe it's time to stop believing the lies that other people have told you about who you are and believe what God says about who you are and start to believe those things, start to meditate on those things, start to mull over those things, the things that God says about you, that you are called, that you are chosen by God, that you are loved by God, that you are a precious son or a daughter of Jesus, that you get to have a relationship with the Father, that He loves you, that He wants to pour out His blessings and His love on you, that He wants to sanctify you. All of these things, the promises that God gives us, Maybe that's the things that we need to start mulling over, to start meditating on, to replace the lies that we might have been told, either by ourselves or, or by something on a screen or by someone in a previous life, whatever it is that we have been thinking on that isn't of God. Maybe it's time to start to replace that with what God says about us. Because God knows us better than we know ourselves, our inner self, our labor, our heart. The next word that he uses is to love God with all of our soul. And the word he uses which is uh, nephesh, which is used a lot throughout the Old Testament, over 700 times. And it's, it's translated into three main words, life, person, and soul. So in other words, your soul is your life, you as a person, who you are. So like your heart, your inner self, the inner man, the labor, that might just be something that only you see. You might be the only one who knows your inner self. In the end, you're the only person who knows what you think on. And yes, that's gonna to start to become evident by how you act and it comes through in other ways. But in the end, that's the part that only you actually see. But who you are as a person, other people see that. Your soul, your life, your person, other people see that. So it is who you are as a person worshiping and loving God. Are you willing to, to sacrifice the things of this world to stand up and say, no, I'm gonna be a person of God. I'm gonna be a man or a woman of God I'm gonna follow what He says about me, who He calls me to be, what He says I am, and follow what God says about me instead of believing the lies that, that come from the world. Are you willing to give God your life and know that He can do better? Can you imagine what would happen if a whole generation of Christianity decided that they were gonna be Bible-believing, Christ-following believers of the Word of God and that their life was gonna be dictated by what God said about them. And they were gonna believe the person that they were in their identity within Christ and not their identity within the world. Can you imagine what would happen? 
if people decide that they were gonna live their life, lay down their life for what Jesus says. We'd see revival before you could speak. Like, the, 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 the mission that that would bring to your workplace, to your university, to your school, to your family, to your social settings, if you decided that the way you were gonna live, the person you were, the life that you led was gonna be one dictated by what Jesus says about you, by what Jesus calls you to be. Whew. Can you imagine how that would change? So, so Moses is saying to the Israelites, love the law, you're God. The, the love meaning like you've got the emotion and you're choosing. You're choosing to love God within your heart, your inner self, what people can't see. And then the way that comes through is then into your life, into your soul, into the person that you are, in your labor and your nefesh. The final one that he says is to love God with all your strength. And the word he uses is meod, which essentially means fullness or muchness or abundance. The, the, the best description I can give you is in Genesis 1, after God created the heavens and the earth, he didn't just say that it was good. He said that it was meod good. That word very is translated from meod. It, essentially, it wasn't just good. Like he created the world to its fullness, its abundance of good. Like it couldn't get any more good. It was the goodest it could be. Like good in the full abundance, the word muchness. It was so good it couldn't get any more good. So we are called to love God the same way in our abundance, to our, to our full. See, we, we know that we need to love God with our inner self and with the person that we are in our life. But as we do that, it needs to be in abundance, in full. And you know what? We're not always gonna get it right. And that's okay. Because we have a God who is so full of grace, so full of mercy, that He would send His Son down so that you and I could still have that relationship with Him. So that even when we might fall away, or we might decide to, to respond to the wrong things or not put God first or, or not have Him, you know, we love Him with our inner self or our person, and we don't love Him to our abundance, He still loves us, no matter what. But we are called to love God with all our strength in full abundance. See, here's where it all ties in. Hopefully we can try and land this a bit. So we've been talking about steps of testimony. Essentially, the testimony of the Israelites crossing into the promised land that God had given them because they stepped into the Jordan River while the Jordan River was still there and just believed because God had told them and promised them that He would make a way for them through the river. And then later on, they then took the promised land. They marched around the wall seven times. I won't go into all the story, but you can read it if you want. And, and, and the promises that God gives them is the steps of testimony that, that we're going through this year. But directly before this is this speech from Moses, the book of Deuteronomy. Literally the final chapter of Deuteronomy is at the very end, it talks about the death of Moses. He dies at the top of Mount Nebo, about 25 minutes from here. Sorry, different Mount Nebo. But he dies at the top of Mount Nebo and then that's the end of Deuteronomy and then it goes Joshua 1 and then Joshua was appointed head of the Israelites. And then from there, that's when they stepped into the promised land. And yes, there was a few stops along the way that you, know, you, you can read the full story. I won't go into all of it. But directly before they enter into the promised land, before Joshua takes over and they actually go and take the promised land, Moses is here saying, look, I'm not gonna make it, but before I die, remember this, you gotta love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your inner self, with all your soul, with who you are as a person, with how you live your life, and with all your strength in full abundance. See, the precursor to the testimony of the Israelites was this exact speech from Moses. The precursor to them stepping into the promised land was Moses saying, you gotta love God with all of your being. 
with the way you act, with what you say, with what you do, what your hands and feet actually do is different to what you might think or say. But how you act, how you respond, the decisions that you make is going to show actually how you love the Lord. A few verses later in Deuteronomy 6, verse 10, it says this, So it shall be when the Lord your God brings you into the land of which he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you large and beautiful cities which you did not build, houses full of things which you did not fill, hone out wells which you did not dig, vineyards and olive trees which you did not plant, when you have eaten and are full. Then... Beware, lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Often we talk about when we go through trials that we, we gotta keep, keep the faith. We still gotta love God. And that's absolutely true. We're gonna get to that in a sec. But the flip side of that is sometimes life's really good. We have great blessings. Life seems to be going really well. You might be really happy. And for me personally, those are the times that I need to remind myself to still have faith, to still love God. Because I'm like, I don't know, it's going pretty well. I, life's good. What do I need God for? And it's in those moments when life is really good, when you're seeing all these blessings, that the temptation comes to forget who brought you out of the land of Egypt, who brought you out of the house of bondage. And Moses is pleading with the Israelites. Hey, in a little while, it's gonna be in a few years from now, you're gonna be sitting back in a lounge chair in a house you didn't have to build, drinking water from a well you didn't have to dig. And you're gonna be like, this is awesome. In that moment, don't forget who brought you here. Don't forget that you came out of Egypt and that God delivered you from the captivity of the Egyptians. Don't forget who led you through the wilderness, who led you through those trials, who rained manna down from heaven so that you could survive through the desert. Don't forget the God who brought you out of bondage. So maybe life is really good. Maybe you've got lots of great things happening at the moment. And I hope that is as many people in here as possible. I really do. And if that's you in that situation, don't forget that you still need a Saviour. Don't forget you've still fallen short of God's glorious standard. Don't forget who brought you out of your trials, who's brought you out of your past hurt and pain and the past suffering and the shame and the guilt that you've experienced. Don't forget who brought you out of that. And then there's the other side of that, the the flip side. What about when things aren't going super well? See, don't forget who brought you out of Egypt can be said in two different contexts when things are going really well and when things aren't. And in fact, Moses says this. He says, don't forget who brought you out of Egypt twice. The first one is the one I just read when life's really good. And here's the other one in Deuteronomy 20. He says, when you go out to battle against your enemies and see horses and chariots and people more numerous than you, do not be afraid of them. For the Lord your God is with you who brought you up from the land of Egypt. See, it doesn't matter what you're going through at the moment. The fact is God has brought you through this before. He can bring you through it. Again, don't forget what God has already done for you. Don't forget how God has brought you through trials, through tribulations, through pain and suffering in the past. It might even just be the fact that He saved you from from death, from sin, from damnation. The fact that God has saved you from that, that is enough to remember what God has saved you from. So I don't know what it is that you might be experiencing this morning. You're somewhere along that continuum. Somewhere between life is really good and life is really not. But what Moses is saying to the Israelites is it doesn't matter. You might be in a place where you're surrounded by enemies and you can feel like there's no way out. Or you might be sitting in a lounge chair in a house that you didn't have to build and life's going really well. Both those times you can't forget.